My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by CyberLife. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the Lagrange equations when there are multiple particles and when constraints are involved. Suppose we had n particles that were free to move in three dimensions. In other words, they were unconstrained. Suppose also that the position of the ith particle in this n particle system was given by the vector ri, which consists of the three coordinates xi, yi, and zi. In that case, the kinetic energy of the entire system, so all n particles combined, would be the sum of the kinetic energies of all the particles. In addition, the potential energy of the entire system would now depend on the positions of all the n particles. This means that the Lagrangian of this entire system would be given by this total kinetic energy minus this potential energy. As with one particle systems, the action integral is once again the integral of this Lagrangian over time, and the Lagrange equations that make this action integral stationary are similar to the Lagrange equations that we had before, but now there are separate Lagrange equations for every particle. So we'd have the three Lagrange equations for particle 1, the three Lagrange equations for particle 2, and so on. If we solve all of these Lagrange equations, we'll be able to determine the equations of motion, so x1, y1, z1, and so on, we'll be able to determine the equations of motion for all the particles. We can just as easily extend these Lagrange equations for multiple unconstrained particles to generalized coordinates, where we replace our Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z by the generalized coordinates q1, q2, and q3, which can basically represent any nice enough coordinate system we want, cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, etc. So if we use generalized coordinates for a system of multiple unconstrained particles, here's what we'll have for our Lagrange equations. Note here that the first subscript on the q denotes the coordinate that we're referring to, so q1, q2, q3, while the second subscript denotes which particle we're referring to. Before we move on to talk about constraints, let's spend some time going over generalized coordinates and what they mean in more rigorous terms. If I have a system of n particles with the position of the ith particle given by the vector ri, then the parameters q1 to qm are said to be generalized coordinates if the position of each of my particles can be fully expressed as a function of just these q parameters and the time t. I'm going to call this equation 1. If this is the case, then I should also be able to express each of my generalized coordinates in terms of the time and positions of all the particles. I'll call this equation 2. In three-dimensional space, we would expect the number of generalized coordinates to be less than or equal to three times the number of particles. Now the number of generalized coordinates needed to fully specify the position of the system is called the degrees of freedom. For example, a particle moving freely in empty space has three degrees of freedom, one degree for the movement in the x direction, one for the y direction, and one for the z direction. However, a particle moving on the surface of a sphere has only two degrees of freedom. Why? Because the particle is restricted from moving away from the surface of the sphere, which essentially confines the particle to moving in only two dimensions. Let me explain further. Suppose that I use x, y, and z to describe the coordinates of the particle, so I start off with three degrees of freedom. But you might remember that the equation of a sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared, where r is the radius. That means I can express one of my coordinates in terms of the other two coordinates, and if I do that, I'll only have two independent coordinates remaining. And since I can completely figure out the position of the particle using just x and y, I can infer z from this equation, and when I do that, I'll have determined the entire position of the particle. Now note that I started off with three degrees of freedom, but because of the equation of the sphere that my particle's position had to obey, I went down to two degrees of freedom. The equation of the sphere is responsible for this fall in degrees of freedom, and in general, any physical limitation which causes a fall in the number of degrees of freedom is called a constraint. Specifically, this constraint is called a holonomic constraint. A holonomic constraint is a constraint that's expressed as an equality and is integrable in form, so basically a constraint that can be written as a function like this. In this case, the equality is the equation of the sphere. Now there's two subtypes of holonomic constraints. One subtype is the constraint that does not explicitly depend on time, which is called a scleronomic constraint. The other type 
is the constraint that does explicitly depend on time, which is called a rheonomic constraint. Alright, so pop quiz. What type of constraint is the equation of the sphere up here? It's a scleronomic constraint because it does not explicitly depend on time. Now, if the radius of the sphere actually happened to be an explicit function of time, then the constraint would become a rheonomic constraint. But for a constant radius capital R, we just have a scleronomic constraint. Finally, what about non-holonomic constraints? Well, a non-holonomic constraint is a constraint not just on the positions or the coordinates, but also on the velocities. In addition, we cannot integrate a non-holonomic constraint to get a function purely in position and time. So there's two properties for non-holonomic constraints. There are constraints that involve velocities, and there are constraints that can't be integrated to get a holonomic constraint. A rolling ball is probably the simplest example of a system with a non-holonomic constraint. Here we have a ball rolling on a rough surface, and the instantaneous velocity of the point at which the ball contacts the ground is zero. This equation is actually not integrable. We can't simply integrate it over time because the position and instantaneous velocity of this contact point will change if we change the orientation of the ball. It's only zero instantaneously when it's at the ground. If we're going to integrate a non-holonomic constraint like this, we would need to know the equation of the ball's motion, which is actually what we're trying to solve for in the first place. So this is what a non-holonomic constraint is, a constraint which usually involves the velocities and which cannot be integrated unless you know the equation of motion of the system. Now generally, because a non-holonomic constraint contains both velocities and positions, we can't express a single coordinate in terms of just the other coordinate, so we can't do what we did with the particle on the sphere and express z in terms of just x and y before we solve for the equations of motion. Because of this, we can't explicitly eliminate degrees of freedom, we can't explicitly eliminate coordinates. So non-holonomic constraints don't affect our degrees of freedom the same way that holonomic constraints do. There's also a third type of a more controversial constraint that falls into neither holonomic nor non-holonomic. It's controversial because sometimes these neither category constraints are classified as non-holonomic, but it depends on the book you're reading. An example of a constraint in this category is an inequality constraint. If we return to the example of our particle and sphere, then a neither category constraint would be saying that the particle must be found outside the sphere and cannot touch or go inside the sphere. In other words, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, x, y, and z being the position of the particle, is greater than capital R squared. Just like non-holonomic constraints, this inequality constraint doesn't explicitly restrict the degrees of freedom. The particle can still move freely in three dimensions, for the most part, it just can't access the region defined by the sphere. Now, despite all this information that you're getting about non-holonomic constraints and neither category constraints, keep in mind that for much of our series on analytical mechanics, I will only be working with holonomic constraints. This bit was just to introduce the fact that other types of constraints exist. Moving on to the last part of the video, how do we solve classical mechanics problems with constraints using the Lagrange equations? Well, we can write the Lagrangian in terms of the total kinetic energy, Ek, of all the capital N particles and the potential energy, U. Once we've written the Lagrangian, we can then write the M constraint equation, or equations, and after that, we write the Lagrange equations for each particle i, but now the Lagrange equations contain additional terms, which involve a Lagrange multiplier lambda j times the partial derivative of the constraint function with respect to that coordinate. We can then solve these Lagrange equations in addition to the constraint equations to obtain all our Lagrange multipliers lambda j and all our equations of motion for the n particles. As you can imagine, this technique is pretty cumbersome, and it's used quite rarely. Another way to solve constrained mechanics problems is to either write one coordinate in terms of the others, or use a coordinate system where one of the coordinates is constant and you're only working with the other coordinates. As an example, let's go back to our particle on the sphere. We know that the coordinates of the particle were constrained by the equation of the sphere, so we could do two things. The first thing is that we could write z as a function of x and y. Now, our kinetic and potential energies will generally still depend on z, but now we can replace all the z's by f of x comma y to make things easier. 
The second thing we could do is use spherical coordinates with the radius held constant at capital R, so that the only two coordinates we have to worry about are theta and phi. Of course, this means that the kinetic and potential energies will now have to be written in spherical coordinates. Now these problem solving techniques might seem a bit hard to grasp, but I'll put them into action in the next video when I actually solve an analytical mechanics problem. Also, you can ask questions in the comments if watching or re-watching the video didn't make things clear. Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my social media pages in the description for you to check out, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.